Welcome, everyone. That's a little bit of nostalgia for some of the older people on the line. We've got folks from across the US and Canada joining us today. And um, to paraphrase the lyrics from the Beatles song, um, we can't wait to take you away to the San Juan Islands so you can experience some of the magic um, that all of us who live here experience. Okay, Siri is talking back to me right now. Okay, my phone keeps wanting to play Beatles songs. Um, anyway, we're gonna do a little tour of the island and then we're gonna do a cook along and um, we're gonna ask you to please mute yourselves and put questions in the chat box. Um, let me just kill my phone here. Okay. All right, there we go. The Beatles are off. All right, so, um, I'd like to, before we start, I'm Barbara Merritt, and I'd like to introduce Amy Nessler, who is the person behind the curtain. Amy, would you wave? So I'm gonna be retiring the end of June and Amy will be capably taking over for me. I, I'll miss a lot of you. We have a lot of our um, media guests and food and wine experts on the line. So I'll miss working with you, but Amy will do a fabulous job. So um, please mute yourself, put questions in the chat box. And to start out, to give you a sense of place, we're gonna show a short video uh, that hopefully will give you an understanding of why our chefs like to make culinary magic here. Amy, could you turn the sound up, please? Okay. So we're having some sound issues. Um, but you're getting a, uh, a visual feast rather than an auditory feast. Okay, so for those of you who haven't visited, the San Juan Islands are in the heart of the Salish Sea. Nutrient waters surround the islands, so we have incredible marine mammals, whales, seals, dolphins, porpoises, but we also have uh, a feast um, in terms of what's available to our island chefs, from seafood to salmon to shellfish. The San Juan Islands are in the rain shadow of the Olympic Mountains, so we get twice as much rainfall as the Seattle area and twice as much sunshine. We have many microclimates here. We're able to grow grapes. Um, we're in the Puget Sound AVA American Viticulture area. So um, this cool climate allows us to grow grapes normally grown in Northern Europe, such as Madeleine Angevine and um, Zegreba. 
And we have three vineyards and wineries in the islands that specialize in those white varietal uh, wines. So if you're coming here, um, we're in this great location in between Seattle to the south. You can see the Space Needle there. Uh, Victoria, BC, Canada to the west and Vancouver to the north. And we're very connected. So we like to say we're real islands, real close. You have to take a ferry or a float plane to get here. So um, it's really fun getting here. You, you get on a ferry um, and you relax and you can walk on, you can bike on, you can take a car ferry. Uh, I mean, you can take your car um, or you can take a float plane. Um, float planes are really cool because they fly really low and you can see the islands scattered below you. You'll often see whales uh, through the surface of the water. If you're taking a ferry, bald eagles. Again, maybe you'll see whales. Uh, you're almost certain to see seals as you make your way to the islands. And when we say we're real islands, real close, it's because we don't have any bridges. Okay, could everyone please mute themselves? I just heard a toilet flush, I think. Um, so we've been nicknamed the Gourmet Archipelago by Lonely Planet Magazine. And this is because of, as I mentioned, the rich seafood, but also the incredible farm to fork, garden to glass dining. And we'll let Chef Gretchen, one of our island chefs, tell you how she finds inspiration to make her culinary magic here. Amy, the sound isn't working on the videos. Okay, well, I think I'm going to have to narrate this. Um, Gretchen moved here, oh, probably 30 years ago. She ran the duck soup restaurant. She's inspired by the amount of organic produce you can find on the island, fruits, vegetables, and also she's inspired by the calm island vibe. She pushes herself to find inspiration from all of the fruits and vegetables found here, from the wines grown here, Okay, is it just me or can other people hear this sound on these videos? No. Okay, let's take, Amy, could you maybe take a moment to see if you can sort that out while I talk about the cast of characters in the islands. So for you travel food and wine writers, there's a lot of inspiration from the type of people who come here. Um, starting on the bottom left, Susie Pingree, uh, who's there with her daughters in front of a beautiful German copper still. She, like a lot of people who have more recently moved here, uh, retired from successful career. She was a uh, professor in Madison, Wisconsin. She came to the island looking for something uh, to do. She and her husband, and they decided to partner with Westcott Bay Cider, the second oldest cidery in Washington state, and uh, create a distillery um, using island grown apples. So a lot of their gins are made with apples. Um, they flavor them and their liqueurs with um, lavender, uh, madrona bark, rose hips, um, and they've made this prize winning collection of gins and liqueurs. And her dream was to make prize winning Calvados. And after they were here for three years, because it takes three years um, to age 
the Apple brandy, they won all kinds of prizes um, for their brandy. And every cask of brandy has one of their grandchildren's names on it. So when they sell brandy from that cask, that goes to the grandchildren's college fund. In the upper right-hand corner, we have Chef Raymond Southern, who he and his wife uh, moved here wanting a slower pace. He made a name for himself in the cruise ship industry. And um, now he and his wife preside over the boutique in the Kingfish Inn on Orcas Island. They just have a handful of rooms and a wonderful, very relaxed island inspired restaurant. They partner with Orca Song Farms on Orcas, make sure everything's super fresh. And then in the bottom hand corner, we have kind of a different model of the type of person who's moved here. A young person who uh, actually grew up on San Juan Island and uh, he decided he wanted to come back. He was a big time sommelier in uh, Las Vegas at the Bellagio. Came back to the island, uh, started the Dobe Wine Company. I know some people um, here joining us today have actually visited Dobe. He works with grapes grown in Eastern Washington to create his Orcas Project wines. Um, whereas the, the wineries and vineyards on the island pretty much use their own grapes to make the white varietals and then import the red grapes from Eastern Washington. But Cole has been so successful that he's going to start uh, a new restaurant and wine bar called Roots. And he had a Kickstarter campaign. His goal was $125,000, which he raised in 72 hours. And he tells us that is the most successful Kickstarter campaign for a restaurant uh, in the US. So um, look for that if you come to Orcas Island this summer, uh, he'll be opening as soon as he spends that Kickstarter money. Um, and then in the upper left, we have Tony Knutson, who uh, we'll hopefully hear from in a minute because um, we have a video of Tony as well. Some of you may have heard of Chef Jay Blackington. He was uh, nominated a top chef in 2018 by Food and Wine Magazine. He was on the cover. Um, he uh, is just a self-taught cook. He was a bicycle messenger and a vegan in Seattle. And he said he learned to cook because nobody was willing to cook for him. Since then, he's gone past his veganism, but he started working out on a farm on Orcas Island, Maple Rock Farm. And um, they started cooking pizza in a wood-fired oven on the farm. And it was so successful that they started Hogstone wood-fired pizza in uh, downtown East Sound on Orcas Island. And that, okay, we're having some te technical difficulties which we didn't have when we practiced. But anyway, um, Chef Jay Blackington uh, just makes incredible wood-fired pizza. And that restaurant was so successful that he started Elder, which has a wonderful tasting menu. Um, I ate there once and had a salad that was just flower petals and it was beautiful and delicious. You know, if it isn't grown on Orcas Island, Jay isn't interested in cooking with it. Okay, and here's another success story, a little bit different. Audra Lawler uh, was in high finance on Wall Street. Um, she had had a couple miscarriages and she looked at her life and she said, I don't want to become like the people around me. So she decided to move back uh, to the Pacific Northwest where she was raised. Um, they vacationed on Orcas Island as a girl she did. And they bought a farm. And she noticed that there was all this fruit dropping from these century old trees. And not only in her yard, but throughout the islands, 
the islands were the fruit basket of Seattle. And when irrigation came to Western Washington, um, pretty much our legacy fruit trees, which are mostly pears, um, figs or plums, and um, apples uh, were just languishing on the ground. So she created this whole business, Gold Meets Dirt, where she makes preserves, shrubs, has a great logo and has been wildly successful. She was written up in Sevier magazine and then uh, the Today Show picked that up and they flew Harry Smith out here to interview her. There's a wonderful clip um, about that. So just a, a taste of the kind of people who've moved here and been successful in the food and wine industry. Buck Bay Shellfish, let's keep our fingers crossed um, that the sound works for this video. Yay! All right, Amy. Hi, welcome. I'm Tony Knudsen, and I'm co-owner of Buck Bay Shellfish Farm on beautiful Orcas Island. We've been doing this business for 13 years and we are a full-fledged shellfish farm. And this is where we do our farming, right here, right out here on Buck Bay. We have 26 acres of farm, of uh, bay here that we actually own. And we do uh, shellfish farming, meaning that we grow oysters and we grow clams. Oysters are meant for love, and I think it's because you have to really nourish them. They, they need a lot of attention. But boy, the terrific product that you get out of oysters is worth all the work that, that we put into it. So that's one of our three shellfish farms. We have West Cop Bay Shellfish on San Juan Island where you can get wonderful barbecued oysters, salads, wine, beer, and you're right on the waterfront, just as uh, obviously, because that's where it's all grown. Um, just like at Buck Bay, they'll teach you how to open oysters, which is really fun. And then also on Lopez Island, we have Jones Family Farms. And depending on which shellfish farm you go to, you can experience Balan or European flat oysters, uh, native Olympia oysters, these are the small oysters native to Washington State, or the larger, generally Pacific oysters, um, spot prawns, finfish, uh, pink singing scallops when they're in season, and finfish. Um, each shellfish farm has a different mix of fish, so it makes it really interesting to go around and sample them. And there's something called miroir, which is like terroir, and it's the, the taste of the ocean. And you will really taste the difference in these oysters depending on which island they've been grown on. So you can um, relax uh, at a wonderful lodging on San Juan Island and you can eat it too. So um, Pebble Cove Farm, the photo on the left, um, they have, a great little farm and we'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute, but they have an organic garden where the guests are free to go in and pick whatever they like to prepare their meal that night. On the higher end scale is Rosario Resort also on Orcas where um, you can have a fine meal and be pampered. So Lydia is gonna tell us a little bit about her farm. Hi, I'm Lydia Miller at Pebble Cove Farm on Massacre Bay on Orcas Island. My family and I have lived on the island for almost 30 years and we've been lucky enough to be here at Pebble Cove Farm for 15 years. It was an old barn and abandoned property on the water and we fell in love with it and turned it into an inn. So we have a few accommodations and we have 
rescue animals that we've adopted from all over the country. When you live on an island, you have to be more careful. You try to be as sustainable as possible. So we take compost from our family and we put compost buckets in all the rooms and we give them to the animals. And then we scoop up the poop it ends up in a compost pile, and after that, it ends up in our garden, and we get to have wonderful produce. Let me introduce you to our very old pony buddy. He's in his late 30s, and we've had him for over 20 years. We have four sheep that we've adopted. These are our wonderful little pigs. They're two brothers, they're Juliana pigs and their mother was found abandoned by a rescue farm and she was pregnant and she had 10 boy piglets and we were lucky enough to get Bernie Sanders and Herman. Over here is Hank. We adopted him a couple of years ago and he's a pony. Dolly is a mini horse and we just picked her up from Friday Harbor last week from a, a family that was moving and so we're really really happy to have her here. When you enter our farm on the gate you'll see a, a sign that says peace to all beings and that's our mission and as we've adopted these rescue animals we have grown to see the connection between what is on our plate and our love of animals and so we're hoping to inspire guests to make that connection when they eat a lamb or pork or bacon in the morning. These pigs are so lovable. They love to be pet and hugged and scratched and they're so trusting and so smart. So we are a vegan family and we hope to inspire others that that might be something that might be aligned with your values. If you're lucky enough to end up being an animal at Pebble Cove Farm, you're going to live a long, long life. I wouldn't mind living on Pebble Cove Farm. I know I'd be treated well. Lydia kind of encapsulates the island ethos of taking care of things and living sustainably. And that's uh, found throughout our restaurants and resorts, most of whom have on-site gardens. This is the garden at Doe Bay Resort on Orcas Island. It's a one acre garden and you're free to wander in the garden. You're not free to pick as you are at Pebble Cove, but if our restaurants don't have an on-site garden, then they're paired with an organic garden in the islands that will furnish them uh, with most of the fresh fruits and vegetables. Most of the restaurants or, or several of the restaurants all, all also go as far as to only serving meat from um, island grown animals who are sustainably slaughtered. Um, and a lot of these restaurants such as Doe Bay are vegetable forward. Um, they do serve shellfish from Buck Bay Farm, which is just down the road. So the food is really hyper fresh and it means it's healthier for you and you don't have to eat as much of it. One of the really fun things to do here is to ride bikes around the island. Lopez Island is the flattest island and has the least uh, amount of traffic. So it's a great place to take your bike and uh, forage at the self-serve farm stands. Um, there are also flower, far flower stands, egg stands. It's amazing what you'll find by the side of the road here. So I would like to introduce uh, Amelia Baggett from Pelandaba Lavender Farm. She's their marketing director. Um, and I'd also like to thank Pelandaba for donating all that culinary lavender, which was mailed to you. Hopefully you've all received it. Um, we mailed it nine days ago to the US and 11 days ago to Canada. So, um, Hope you received it in time and uh, were able to make the lavender sugar and simple syrup. So Amelia, tell us about Pelandaba. Thank you, Barbara. 
this year at the farm, we're celebrating 20 years of sharing our deep love of lavender. From our organically certified fields, we cultivate millions of fragrant flowers, which are all harvested by hand throughout the summer. Some of these fresh flowers are destined to be dried and others distilled in our on-site distillery before they're all used to handcraft over 200 lavender-based products from the soaps and lotions, as one might expect, to lesser known pet care products and culinary products. Lavender's uses are so effective and varied, they're almost magical. To name just a few, it's a topical anesthetic and antiseptic, a highly effective insect repellent, and an edible herb with the versatility to enhance both the sweet and the savory. We love being able to open the farm to visitors to come and experience lavender at the source. Visitors immerse themselves in a truly magical experience amongst the lavender. They can see and smell, touch, hear it rustling in the breeze, and taste it just as we are going to do together today. Thanks so much, Amelia. Pillandaba Lavender Farm is open to the public year round. It's particularly spectacular, of course, in the spring when, I mean, in the summer, when the lavender is in full bloom, which is around um, mid-July. So I would now like to introduce Chef Tim Payne uh, from Coho Restaurant. Tim, hello. hello I know you're there somewhere. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Well, uh, my name is Tim Payne, as she mentioned, and uh, I'm the chef at Coho Restaurant. I've been here since 2017. Coho is a restaurant that focuses on seasonal cooking, much like what you heard. We source quite a bit of our food uh, during the season from um, island farmers, ranchers, and different artisans. Um, we change our menu several times of the, of the year to take advantage of that. Coho has been in business over 10 years and is located uh, in Friday Harbor. Okay, and now uh, if you're cooking along, we're about to start. Hi, my name is Tim Payne. I'm the chef at Coho Restaurant here in Friday Harbor on beautiful San Juan Island. And it is a wonderful, beautiful spring day here. Sun is out, the flowers are blooming, birds are chirping. And one of the things that is really amazing about our island that makes us special is the availability of culinary lavender. We are blessed to have the access to this and it is very underused in most people's kitchens. So today we're gonna to explore a few different fun ways to use culinary lavender in your home. So what we are gonna to do to start things off here is we're going to make a cocktail. So when I cook, I like to have a cocktail. Um, try not to have too many um, for safety reasons. But we're gonna feature a few different things here. Um, a couple of spirits that are made here on the island, which are fantastic. So we're gonna make a version of a martini that's themed around lavender. So uh, we have, uh, as far as ingredients here, you'll notice in your packet, uh, you'll need a gin. We have a uh, local gin from the distillery here on the island. And we have a lavender liqueur which is, uh, again, the same distillery here on the island, and lavender simple syrup. So in your packet, you'll notice that there are recipes we're not gonna talk about here that are very simple, basic pantry recipes, and one of which is lavender simple syrup. Now, this simple syrup will uh, stay in your refrigerator for a really long time, as long as you're not putting your fingers or you're not putting uh, a dirty spoon that introduces bacteria. Um, and it is simply, you know, equal parts, water, sugar, lavender buds. You let it steep and then you strain it and store it. So we're gonna make the cocktail here. So I have a more fancy uh, cocktail shaker. If you do not have this, a couple of options would be to use a mason jar. Just simply close the lid, shake it and strain it. Um, or you could just stir. That would work as well if you have a, a big glass. But we're gonna use a cocktail strainer here and go through our ingredients. So we have the spy hop, 
uh, gin. And I have one of these really cool um, mixologist kind of measuring things. But, uh, you know, if you want a stiffer drink, more gin. If you want a weaker gin, drink less gin. Uh, we're going to uh, do a kind of a standard amount. So it's essentially about a shot, uh, just over two ounces. And we're going to pour that in here and measure. Or if you're brave and you're Tom Cruise from Cocktail, you can free pour. Uh, I am not that person, so I'm gonna measure here. And then we're gonna add uh, some lavender simple syrup here. It's about a two to one ratio between the simple syrup and the cocktail, it's the liquor, or in this case, the gin. Uh, we're gonna add, it says one ounce of lemon. I think, you know, generally that's about a half a lemon squeezed. If you don't have one of these, you can just hand squeeze it, or you can really cheat and buy lemon juice, but fresh squeezed, uh, this does a couple of things. Uh, number one, it gets the juice but when you're squeezing it, you're puncturing the skin, which is releasing a lot of the essential oils, which is actually that lemon citrus flavor is in the oils, not in the juice. So squeezing it, you'll get some of that released into the cocktail as well. Uh, and then we have our liqueur here. Uh, now this liqueur is a lavender and wild rose infused liqueur. And again, it's just a splash. So it's just a half ounce, about a tablespoon. And that goes in. And then this is where you get to uh, practice your cocktail skills and shake it. Um, most people will say you want to do this for, you know, 20 seconds. And you will spill like I do, which is fine. Don't be a perfectionist. Okay, we're going to take this out. Uh, we have a couple of things here. Martini glass, it can go in any glass. But if you want to get your inner James Bond on, you will want to have a cocktail glass, a martini glass. And as he would say, shaken, not stirred. Um, you could stir it though. So we're going to strain this in. You may ask, why are we not putting the ice in and that's because we want it to chill the drink down but the ice if we leave it in and it melts it's going to dilute the, the drink so you may start off with a certain ratio of alcohol to lemon juice to sugar and when the ice melts that ratio is going to change so the flavor of the drink is going to change as a result and then your favorite garnish if you're lucky to have a lavender plant then um, you know fresh lavender flowers would be great or a sprig of lavender uh, or a lemon. And there you have it. It's the Laventini, um, a fun little play on a martini uh, that features lavender from here on the island, uh, turned into a simple syrup, and local distilled gin. Wherever you're at, this, uh, if you can find local distilled gin, support your local purveyor. All right, so let's move into uh, another recipe that we're going to work on today. And this is a using a couple of things here. Um, lavender, of course, as this is the theme, um, but we're gonna in integrate uh, local goat cheese from Lopez Island. Um, most places around the country, you know, you'll find artisan cheeses like this available. So I would encourage you as you're doing this to go to your farmer's market, co-op, um, et cetera, and try to find some kind of local fresh goat cheese. Make sure it's a fresh goat cheese um, rather than an aged one. So we're gonna make stuffed portobello mushroom caps. So the first step in your packet would be to stem them and roast them. And I wanted to show you this before we move on. There's a little wa water in here because the first step is to roast them to purge a little bit of that water. So when it comes out, let it cool and dump it. And I have here the onions, um, garlic, and the reserved mushroom stems that were sauteed. And we're going to uh, puree those now in a food processor with the lavender and the goat cheese. So you want to make sure these are not blazing hot. Um, you also want to make sure your goat cheese is brought out so it's close to room temperature. Um, but we're going to take our goat cheese. Uh, again, it's a fresh chev. You can see how soft it is that goes in the food processor. 
Uh, we have our lavender. Uh, this is dried lavender flowers. Um, we're going to dump that in there as well. And then we have our uh, onions, which were sauteed. Uh, the idea is to caramelize them slightly, so about halfway through you'll notice it's starting to turn brown. Then that's when you want to add the mushrooms. Um, and then once the mushrooms start to soften, then add the garlic. So that goes in, in phases there. And so all that's going to go in here. It's a very simple process. You'll notice I'm not adding any, any salt right now. Um, the, the, the goat cheese does have uh, salinity to it. And I did lightly salt the onions as I cooked them. So that all goes in here. And then we're going to pulse it to combine it. You want to break up those uh, mushrooms that are in um, here because they're not chopped down. And you want to do it uh, so it's relatively smooth because we're going to use a piping bag to fill the mushroom caps. If you do not have a piping bag, you can do this with a spoon. It's going to be a little bit slower process, but it's definitely something that you can do. Um, the other option would be to get a Ziploc freezer bag um, and fill it and then cut it a corner of it so that you can squeeze out simulating what a piping bag would be. Not everybody has piping bags sitting around their house. And here's what you have. So you have this really cool uh, goat cheese, almost mousse. Uh, we're going to use the fill the mushrooms. You could also use this as a spread on uh, crostini, crackers, etc. But we're going to take it and we're going to fill the pastry bag now. And it's very likely because the mushrooms come in different sizes that you're going to have a, you might have extra. What other cheeses can you use? Uh, mascarpone would be good. Um, you could use cream cheese if you were so inclined. You could use borson, ricotta. They all would work here. One of the flavor pals, and that, when we cook, that's kind of, we often refer to this, but a flavor pal of lavender is things that are bright and acidic. And then if you were going to look at herbs, you're going to look at herbs such as savory, thyme, oregano would be good flavor pals for them. So once you have this in here, you'll notice I'm twisting like that. I'm trying to get some uh, pressure there. I'm going to cut the end. Because there might be chunks, you probably want it cut a little bit bigger. And now we're going to fill our mushroom caps. This is could be done in steps and stages. So you could have the mushroom caps done and in the refrigerator done the, the day before. So, and then you just want to fill. So what I usually do is I'll fill about to the top first, and then to make sure I have enough. I think the recipe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is 24 mushrooms. But again, you're gonna have different sized mushrooms most of the time. So that could be, there could be some slight variance there. And we're going to fill these and pop them into the oven. And while they're cooking, we're going to move on to our next little project here. So I have some left over. I just want to look and see if there's any, because if any look a little light. And these also great sandwich spreads. So don't forget that that's uh, something you can do. So I have a preheated 375 degree oven and we're going to pop this in. When people think of lavender, a lot of times they do kind of think more sweet. Uh, I thought it was important that they, you could see the variety of uses that you could do with lavender. So we have a cocktail um, and then we have something savory, the stuffed mushrooms and then Traditionally, a lot of people think of lavender, they think desserts. So we're going to make a whipped cream, chantilly cream, uh, using 
cream that has been, um, that's something we never couldn't really do in the demonstration, but it's cream that has been steeped with lavender and with vanilla bean. So you, in following the directions, you'll notice that that is steeped and then you want it to sit overnight. Now, a few little things about uh, whipping cream. If you don't have a nice mixer is you want to have your bowl cold and clean and you want to have your cream cold and those will all help with the whipping cream. So what we're doing with the whipped cream here is we're incorporating air and uh, giving it body. Now this is a great, great, great easy springtime dessert is just simply berries and cream. So we're about strawberry season and nothing is better with strawberries than chantilly cream. And you can uh, simply do a little, you can make it fancy and put it in cocktail glasses, but you just layer it, creams and berries, creams and berries. And if you wanted to get even more flavor, what you would do is you would add you would take some of the lavender sugar or simple syrup and you would marinate the berries in that. And this is the fun exercise part of the video. So most people wouldn't be up for this. So if you have a mixer, you may want to use a mixer. Um, it tests my ability to stretch out conversation too. So, uh, you know, I'm not the best with jokes, but I love food and I love doing this kind of thing. So you'll see already that the cream's getting thicker, so we're almost there. Um, if you're in culinary school seeing kids try to learn this, it's pretty comical because most people are, have their elbow out and they get tired and then they have to stop and they start sweating and um, you can't see it. I'm working up a sweat. All right, see how it's coming together? We're almost there. And that didn't take too long. My bowl was clean, my bowl was cold, and the cream was cold. And you can see how now, that's what you call stiff, stiff peaks. So this is perfect. Um, you can make it softer if you want, but at this point, it's ready to use. Top any dessert you want to with it. Um, or you go the berries and cream route. Um, French toast, pancakes, cakes, etc. Now our mushrooms are cooking. We're gonna take a real quick peek to see where they're at. You can see that they're starting to brown. We're gonna give that just a couple of minutes. It's, it'll take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes for you whenever you uh, bake the mushrooms off. But we're gonna take a look and I think they're about done. I can hear them sizzling. and you can uh, kind of see where the tops are starting to brown and at this point they're ready to eat. So um, put them on a platter. Again, lavender flowers would be great and they'll work well with any party or get together you have or as a light meal uh, for, for people with the salad would be great. And there you have it. So I hope you've enjoyed all the recipes today and can find uh, other uses for lavender. There's a lot of them out there. These are just an example of a few, but I hope you enjoy the recipes and enjoy spring. Thanks so much for uh, that, Chef Tim. Um, I was tempted to make a lavender teeny because I'm going on vacation tomorrow, but instead, <laughs> I made iced tea with the lavender sugar and it's absolutely delicious. Um, there's some questions in the chat box for Chef Tim and for Amelia and I'll just read those questions out. So Amelia and Tim, if you would unmute yourselves, that would be great. Um, the first question was from Rachel Stearns and any substitution suggestions for the liqueur? I like iced tea and then Priscilla Willis answered, she has a tea recipe as well, it's in the chat box. But I'd like to hear from Tim and Amelia if you have a suggestion of 
what to substitute for the liquor in the lavender teeny or lavantini. <laughs> uh, one of the things that they may want to consider, uh, you would have to slightly change the process, but sparkling water or soda water, uh, you would be stirring instead of shaking, uh, but adding the simple syrup and the citrus to that, you essentially are creating a little uh, lavender soda. That's one thing I would, uh, I would suggest. Thanks, Tim. Amelia? First thing that comes to my mind um, as a substitute for a liquor-based cocktail is just lemonade. Just your, whatever is your favorite lemonade recipe or limeade um, and adding the simple syrup to that. Lavender and lemon, as we've seen in the cocktail recipe, is a fabulous combination. Yeah, that's Great, and if you go to the lavender farm, um, you can sample lavender tea, you can buy lavender tea, you can buy lavender lemonade, you can even buy lavender ice cream, which is fantastic. It's Lopez Creamery ice cream. Um, okay, here's a question for Amelia. I have a lavender plant in my yard. How do you tell if it's culinary lavender and what's the difference between culinary lavender and lavender grosso, which is what's used for making most lavender products? Well, that's a good question. Um, lavender for culinary purposes has more to do with when it's harvested than the variety. Um, most lavender varieties you can use for cooking. All of the um, varieties that are in the intermedia species, as well as the angustifolia species, you can use. The only ones that aren't as good for uh, use as an ingredient, although they're beautiful as a garnish, are the stika species, which is what's in your drink, Barbara. It makes a beautiful garnish, um, but not so great for cooking. Um, right. So anything in the angustifolia species or the intermediate species is great. Um, the flavor comes predominantly from the actual plant material. So the dried buds that you received uh, in the mail. And that flavor is uh, easily drowned out by the essential oil that is also produced in the buds of the plant. So the essential oil smells fabulously, has many different uses, uh, but it's very bitter to taste and it easily drowns out the delicate flavor of the plant material itself. So when we're harvesting for culinary purposes, we try to harvest earlier in the season when there's less oil in the buds, more flavor. If we wait longer in the season and harvest towards the end of the season, that's when the essential oil is at its peak and it will smell incredible, but it will taste rather bitter. And so if you have a plant in your own garden, Harvest early. Harvest when just a couple buds have started to bloom and dry it in the dark or someplace with some nice ventilation. Um, and you can certainly use that for cooking. If you have lavender, dry lavender at home right now, not what we sent you, but just additionally, and you're wondering if you could cook with it, squeeze a few of the buds between your fingers. If they're really strongly scented, they're going to be um, a bit more bitter to taste. And so you'd want to use them in a recipe that um, has a high sweet quotient to kind of balance out that bitterness. But if it doesn't have much scent, taste it. You, you'll, be able to be, you'll be able to tell that flavor coming through. If you don't have a plant and you want to continue experimenting uh, with lavender in the kitchen, we can certainly provide you with culinary lavender. And we have all of our products on our website at melandavalavender.com. And we ship, of course, everywhere. Um, Great, thank you, helpful. Amelia. They, they also have um, Herbs de Provence that contain lavender that's wonderful to add to uh, fresh goat cheese with a little bit of olive oil and uh, garlic, it makes just a wonderful spread. And if you do come to the islands, um, Pelandaba Lavender Farm on San Juan Island has a whole 
museum or interpretive area about lavender and all the incredible things that lavender can do and has been used for historically. Um, I have a question for Chef Tim. What other dishes do you recommend um, or what other dishes do you use lavender in? Um, I like lavender with pork and lamb. Uh, usually in the form of a marinade or rub. It just pairs really well with both meats, particularly uh, the pork we use on the island is a heritage breed, so it has a little bit more of that porky uh, flavor. And lavender goes really, really well with that, and particularly when you're grilling them. That's probably my favorite um, other use. Okay, and we have someone asking uh, for you to share the social handles um, for the restaurant. And that's something, if you can't do it, uh, we'll try and find it and put it in the chat box. Amy, could you do that, do you think? Um, okay, let's see. Um, all right. Those are the questions we have in the chat box. And now um, let's unmute everyone. And you can just, if you have any questions, we have a few minutes left. If you have any questions about visiting the islands, about the lavender farm, about our restaurants, um, go ahead and um, we'll just see how this works. Uh, start talking. <laughs> I did notice a question um, okay. regarding the lavender sugar. What type of sugar do you use? Um, regular granulated sugar. Right. And, um, you know, someone actually emailed me separately and asked me the question, like, how do you not have the, um, I thought this was funny, the lavender in a dish tastes like a bath bomb. Like, how do you make sure you don't have too much lavender um, in your dish, or is that even possible? First of all, use culinary lavender. If you get a lavender like, in a pretty sachet bag and it smells beautifully, if you use that to cook, it's going to have more essential oil in it, which is what our nasal experience associates with a bath bomb or with lotion or with personal care. So making sure that you're using culinary gray lavender and then not going overboard. Experiment with it, start small and then add more so that it, you can achieve a, a balanced flavor that works for your palate. Chef Tim probably has more uh, culinary ways of saying that. <laughs> That's actually the best thing is this start small. Everyone's palate's a little bit different and their sensitivity is going to be different. So err, always err on the kind of the smaller side and just taste and adjust to your palate. That's the best recommendation. Talked about the, um, the medicinal uses of lavender. Um, it's funny because I associate lavender with headaches because my mom always used lavender and would brush it across her forehead when she had a headache. Does it actually really work for that? Oops, You're muted. Sorry, I was okay. muted. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, before our call, I was doing some writing about the medicinal uses of lavender. Um, it is indeed a fabulous topical anesthetic pain reliever um, and um, antiseptic, um, as well as a, oh gosh, this word is always incredibly difficult for me to pronounce. So I'm gonna look at it while I say it. An anaxiolytic, which is um, a agent that reduces stress, reduces anxiety. That's where the soothing, calming, headache reducing aromatherapy properties reside within the essential oil. So your mom is absolutely correct, Liz. It's a very good use for it. You're muted, Barbara. 
When is the harvesting season for lavender in the San Juan Islands? Summertime. We usually start harvesting uh, for culinary somewhere between early to mid July, depending upon um, how quickly the bloom is coming on, which has to do with the weather right now. The colder, um, cloudier spring will push the bloom a little later. A hot, hotter, sunnier, drier spring will bring it, bring it forward. But we're harvesting between um, mid-July all the way through into September because we do so many different things with the lavender. We harvest portions of the fields uh, throughout that time. So if someone's coming to visit, they're going to see purple from July through September. We do the very final harvest for all of our essential oil distillation when the oil is at the peak of its potency in the plant. And that happens end of August into the beginning of September. And so because lavender is so versatile, it makes for a really wonderful visiting experience because we are in unlike other cover crops or harvest crops, you aren't harvesting everything at the same time where one day it's there and the next day it's gone. Our fields go from all purple to slightly more green, slightly more green, slightly more green until about half, um, they're about halfway harvested. And then it stays that way until the essential oil harvest. Okay, thank you. Amelia, um, we have several food and wine and travel writers on the call and I'm wondering, um, is it okay for them to publish the recipes um, with credit, of course? Oh yeah, oh yeah, by all means. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Oh, one other thing, the lavender makes a beautiful garnish. You know, even if you're not using it in your dishes, it's, it's really fantastic to um, make a plate really sparkle. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I did have a question about, um, sorry, uh, mailing images, and we were happy to do that as well. So this is our contact information. Um, these are our social handles. Um, we really appreciate um, you sticking with us. Um, we like to say in the San Juan Islands, we're not slick. We did have some technical difficulties, but we are sincere. And we like to have a lot of fun. And I hope you got a feeling of the islands and the people who come here um, who love this place. And we're gonna end with a pig war cocktail. Um, this is uh, perched on the railing at um, Roche Harbor on San Juan Island. It's um, in commemoration of the pig war, which was a peaceful 12 year standoff between the US and the British over who would own the San Juan Islands. The only bloodshed was that of a pig. That's why it's called the Pig War. Um, this is a wonderful cocktail using um, Westcott uh, Bay Distillery, or sorry, San Juan Island Distillery, uh, Spy Hop Gin, Triple Sec, a little bit of cranberry, um, and some fruit juice and grenadine. And uh, okay, everybody, um, here's to you. Think of us when you make your lavender teeny and recipes. And I can't thank Amelia and Chef Tim enough for all the time and energy they put into this. And to Amy too, for sweating um, through this. And we got it all to work in the end. So uh, thank you everyone. You can email us if you have questions. Oh, somebody said the stuffed mushrooms were delicious. Great, okay, I haven't tried those yet. Okay, everyone, um, take care. <laughs>